might think Aisha Bo always had it together. From Michigan engineering grad student to NASA engineer, she's now the CEO of STEMboard, a tech company focused on historically underrepresented youth. Despite this success, Aisha says she struggled with school and low self-esteem as a teenager. In this episode of Re-Engineering Radio, Aisha tells Rob Woodfork at WTOP News in Washington, D.C. how she overcame those challenges and what's next. Adapted with permission. All right, I am with Aisha Bo of STEM Board. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. All right, so... Um, Let's just start from the beginning, literally. Uh, Tell me about your upbringing. Like, where'd you grow up? How was it with your folks? Oh, wow. So (laughs) we're going to start with, like, Genesis, right? Chapter one. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm from a town in Michigan called Ann Arbor. Okay. Some people may know it for the football, but it was a really interesting place because my mother and father met while they were in school there. So my dad comes from um, the Bahamas. And my mother comes from the Bronx in New York. So you can imagine that there's like this cool chemistry when two people from two entirely different worlds um, meet. And that really formed the backdrop for my upbringing because we had this huge Caribbean influence. My dad is one of nine children. My mom is an only child. Wow. So my dad's family culture was the prevailing family culture in the household. And the Caribbean culture is really rich. Great food, amazing people. It was good it was good. But when I was in middle school, I started to have trouble because my parents ended up um, divorcing, essentially, right? And and it's funny because at the time, you feel this like really deep sense of shame about all those activities, and you grow up and you realize that you're not alone, and those things happen to many people around you. But at the time, I really lost focus on work. And I was thinking about things like self-esteem and self-confidence. And ultimately, and I'll just Cliff's Notes version, I I lacked it. And so I was not a strong student in high school. I wasn't focused. I wasn't attending high school. I was what you call truant. And I hope that not many people know the definition of that word, (laughs) Uh, at least not those high schoolers out there. It wasn't until I found myself in community college that I sort of lucked into the role that I have now as an engineer. And that may sound strange, but I was in community college. I thought I was going to be an international business student. And I really laugh looking back on this because I was dead set that I was going to do business and travel the world. And I was no good in economics. I did not receive a grade in economics that anybody would consider to be um, good. And I went home and I was really discouraged because at this point in time, I had underperformed in high school. I'm in community college, which has a huge stigma around it that I am working to bust because community college is an amazing way to start your academic career or enrich an existing career. Absolutely. And I sit with my dad and he just looks at me and he's like, what happened? And I don't know why it is that when you're just trying to eat and be left alone, your parents always just want to dig in, right? It's like they know that you would be particularly annoyed if they drilled in on you at that moment and they just go (laughs) for it. Like, hey, so you just got your plate. What happened with your grades? Right. Ah. And I said to him that I, I had this class. You already know about it. I'm not really trying to talk about it. I just want to eat. And I received a C and uh, yeah, I'm like redefining. I'm trying to figure out like how I feel about my life right now. Leave me alone. And he said, take a math class. I was like, wait, what? Like, what? <laughs> Hold up. Wait. So I told you that I didn't do all so well. And you're telling me to take this math class. I'm not really understanding your line of reasoning, but I guess if you're going to pay for it, I'm going to roll with it. So let's just let it ride. And so I started my engineering degree with pre-algebra at Washtenaw Community College. And in this pre-algebra class, I did well. And I didn't think anything of it because I've graduated high school. I'm taking pre-algebra in a community college. I don't think of that as a monumental accomplishment. Like getting an A in that class, 
did not indicate to me that I might have some hidden genius that I need to pursue. Not at all. And that class turned into another class, which turned into another class. And I remember being in Calc 1 and feeling as though I knew what was going on. And I ended up doing well in Calc 1 and then taking Calc 2. And it was at this point in time that I had an interaction with one of my teachers where they said, I think that you need to think about what it is that you want out of your life. And it was there that I began to realize that at my age, I had no self-confidence and I didn't have any direction. And I think that's true of a lot of people, regardless of whether or not they're in high school or they're adults. But you really have to take time to build your confidence. And I didn't have any. And so that night I went home and I sort of sat with myself. And I started saying, well, what if you threw out how you thought about yourself and you just kind of made stuff up? Like, what would the world look like if you made up having confidence and you decided to do the most outrageous things you could think of. And so I made this list and it was, well, I'm gonna transfer into an engineering program after I finish community college. And it's not gonna just be an engineering program, it's gonna be the aerospace engineering program. And it's gonna be at the University of Michigan because Michigan was the best and the brightest in the region, go blue. And from there, I was going to work at NASA because, you know, aerospace engineers, they work at NASA. Done. That was my list. And I even found, like, these, these totems. I, I found some luggage tags for Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a NASA facility in Pasadena. And I hung them on the list. I got a, an old school thumbtack, and I put it on the list, and I put it on my wall so that every morning when I woke up out of bed, I would see this list. And I would see it again, and I would see it again, and I would look at it, and I would say, okay, well, you know, what does it feel like? Like, what is what would life be like if that actually happened? And I would imagine it, and I would pray that I didn't get, you know, a failing grade in my next class. And what I started to realize was that um, life really is a series of small wins. And it's the incremental things that you do every day that make a difference over the long haul. Mm -hmm. And just by looking at that particular goal, what you focus on expands. And so I wake up, do a little bit more work. And what ended up happening was exactly that. And it sounds to some people like a fairy tale narrative, but I went from Washtenaw Community College to the aerospace program at the University of Michigan. It was not at all a smooth transition. I had to learn a lot of things because I was not fully present in high school. And so I had to make up a lot of that in college. But I doubled down and being a student that didn't have a lot of resources, I made do. I stuck it out when I didn't do well in classes and I took them again when I needed to. And I graduated from undergrad and I ended up getting a master's in um, space systems engineering. I did an undergrad in aerospace engineering. And lo and behold, I went and I worked at NASA Ames Research Center in San Francisco. Now it wasn't JPL in Pasadena, so it wasn't quite the dream, but they say that when God closes the door, he opens a window, so I'll take it. <laughs> right, right. Now there was a tie-in with Mardi Gras in that math class, right? You know I got to get that story. You know I got to get that story. Okay. <laughs> That's too good not to tell. So, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, in the, any good story, you kind of got to start like what had happened was. Right. So what had happened was my best friend from high school is this amazing anesthesiologist. She decided that she would go to Tulane for her undergrad and her med school. Solid choice. New Orleans. We are in our first Mardi Gras experience. At least my, I know it was my first Mardi Gras experience. Let's just be honest. If you've ever been to Mardi Gras, 
there are a lot of experiences that you may or may not recall. <laughs> it's a fun time. Sure. It's a good time. Sure. Even when it's not Mardi Gras, New Orleans is a hey, good time. <laughs> my favorite time to go is Halloween, but that's another yeah, that's, story. That's another story. We'll another do that story. for the sequel. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I go to Mardi Gras. We have a great time, and uh, I was feeling the effects after I came back. <laughs> and like any responsible student, I happened to stack my flight just in time to catch a makeup exam. I don't know why. I mean, I look back and I just wonder sometimes if like some of my parts of my brain were still soft because it was just not a good idea. <laughs> like, why would you put an exam right after Mardi Gras? Yeah. And voluntarily elect to take it not not the smartest thing that I, I could have done so I dragged myself into this exam I think I just rolled off the plane I'm a hundred percent sure that I probably smelled like yesterday's booze <laughs> and I just want to get out alive because I have a pounding headache I'm just I'm post Mardi Gras right I go and I take the exam and I really think that I succeeded in irritating my professor because my professor had changed the exam questions because he, he presented me the paper and he was so proud he was like here's your exam and I'm like ah okay I missed the original exam I know that you probably switched the lineup just to make sure that no one in the class shared any knowledge with me and this is going to be rough so I sit there and I take the exam and I kind of just like push it over to him because at this point in time I'm done you know how that is when you, you're just like, look, I need to go home. I need to drink miso soup or broth or something. <laughs> and I need to take a nap. And then tomorrow I'm going to revisit my existence. But today I'm just like, I'm done. Right. And this is that. And I hand him the paper and he's looking at me because clearly I need a nap. And his response is, you got 100. And I almost didn't think he was serious because there was no excitement in the delivery. It was deadpan. You got 100. It's like, oh, well, isn't that a good thing? Like, isn't that great? Like, 100, okay. I... So 100%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, was not, he was not a fan. That is incredible. He was not a fan. <laughs> and he hands it to me and he's just like, look. And that was the interaction that I spoke of where he, he kind of said, you know, hey, um, I changed this exam. You didn't have a problem with it. And you're not working with the full deck right now. So I think that you need to reevaluate. Which, okay, I did. I did after I had some time to recuperate. And I did a thoughtful reevaluation, just mm -hmm. not, not at the time. That is incredible. <laughs> it's life. You know, it's so funny because life will speak to you when you least expect it. Right. I did not think that Mardi Gras was going to be my gateway into, you know, fake self-confidence and achievement. It just kind of happened that it worked out that way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, talk a bit about what you did at NASA. And as I understand it, you didn't even take that job right away, even though it's been characterized as your dream job. Absolutely. My dream job. It was the most awesome job. And in fact, I mean, I, I don't have the words to describe how fun and awesome it is to work at NASA. I will start with the point that I made about self-confidence in that I didn't have any. While I was in school, I was constantly comparing myself to other people. And you can't measure your life by someone else's self, like someone else's achievement. I didn't grow up in their environment. I, I bootstrapped my way into school. I was lucky to find enough cash to be there. And I was even luckier to graduate. And here I am looking at my resume and my grit and discounting the value of that. And saying, well, you should take the 4.0 kids. Because I was under the impression that the 4.0 kids were the ones who were successful in life. And the reality is, is that if you desire to be successful, you will be successful. And so when I met the engineering director from NASA Ames, who was at the university recruiting and working on uh, collaboration because NASA, and NASA Ames and University of Michigan had some joint programs. 
I was more than happy to sit and talk with him about my background and help him meet students that I thought could be a really good fit. And when he said, well, I don't want them, I want you, I was, I was just flabbergasted and I felt like that was an injustice to all the 4.0 students out there. <laughs> Why would you take anyone less than a four point? I'm like, you're NASA. You could have all the four points. You don't need me. I'm not a four pointer. And he looked at me and he said something that I'll never forget in life. And he said, you know, it's not always about your academic pedigree. I need to know that you're going to be able to handle failure. I need to know that you know how to work with a team. I need to know that you can give a technical status brief and people aren't going to fall asleep. I need to know that people are going to like to spend time with you. Now, I'm not saying that people necessarily like to spend time with me, but we can work on it, right? Some people enjoy me, some people don't. I don't know. You can't be all things to all people. Sure. But there were all these other elements to success that in my academic environment weren't necessarily prized because it was we were graded on who did the best on the particular assignment. And there's no soft skills in, like, your gas dynamics homework. It's did you get the right answer or not? But in life he started to show me that there was more to success than that. It was the hustle. And that, that experience was the first of many that really changed how I view life and what's possible. So my first day at NASA, I wish that there was a movie because I would have, like, I, I, like, the music going on in the background, like, the look, my first In-N-Out burger. So I get to San Francisco. The first thing I eat is In-N-Out. I head over to check in. There's this giant NASA meatball sign. And I felt like my skin was just tingling every single part of my body because I could not believe that I was legitimately there. Like this kid from Ann Arbor, Michigan, who did not do well in high school, who was a community college graduate of Washtenaw Community College, because they're awesome and I gotta shut them out, <laughs> is at NASA Ames Research Facility and I have a job, and like a real job. And it was crazy to me that they were paying us so much money to think, I mean to think, mm -hmm. and think about cool stuff. And there's airplanes on the tarmac and there's a wind tunnel and there's like an arc jet, which if you don't know what arc jet is, you should Google it because it's cool. So much Stuff. Yeah. And I was probably really annoying because I just walked around. <laughs> like this that's like kind of like the one thing about me is like if I'm really interested in something, like I'm just gonna bug you. And the first year, I think I went to a different building like every day. <laughs> and I was like, I'm new. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> and I saw like the coolest stuff. Yeah. And I was like, Later, when I read the, the Dale Carnegie book that was How to Win Friends and Influence People, there's a passage in there where he was saying that if you want for people to think that you're a great conversationalist, ask them about themselves. Mm -hmm. I learned that firsthand because I didn't have to give any justification of why I was here. My first question was, what do you do and how did you get here? Mm -hmm. Three hours later, I had a new friend. It was the best. <laughs> And that's the first year. Yeah. The second and the third year, I started to realize that not only was I there, there was something that I could contribute to the national knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were building nano satellites. Size of satellite was the size of a shoebox. Like, how could you not like that job? And it was going in space. Mm -hmm. Satellites in space as a job. Yeah. What? That's... Yes. <laughs> yes. And then I ended up in Kodiak, Alaska. Also incredible. Highlight. Like, I, I'm sure that anybody that's listening can tell that I'm, like, wildly gesticulating because NASA is an incredible place <laughs> to start your career. It's an incredible place to have a career. I don't care where you are in your career. It's just an incredible place. And I was constantly faced with problems that had never been solved before, experts, I mean, everything from having lunch with Nichelle Nichols to 
getting the first peek at what was going on with the new launch vehicles to traveling all over the country and just roaming around other NASA centers and asking them the same thing. And that was a great six years. And you were there six years uh, and primarily based out of? Ames Research Ames, Center, Ames Research which is Center. in Mountain View, California. Right. Okay. Okay. But you did go to a lot of the other NASA centers as well. I mean, obviously not primarily working from there, but you, I mean, your travels took you to other centers, right? Yes. Okay. Because I'm one of those people where I don't ask for permission. I ask for <laughs> forgiveness. So like if I can get to your facility, I'm going to check you out. Sure. So sure. Houston, amazing. Yeah. Johnson is so historic. Sure. When you think about all of the people that would have walked the halls in Johnson, and where you go to the vertical assembly building at Kennedy Space Center, I mean, just being part of that legacy, mm -hmm. which ties into hidden figures so nicely. I worked at a building that had the original NACA crest. And for those of you who do not know, NACA was the predecessor to NASA, one letter change. Mm. NACA was the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Obviously, we didn't start off in space. We sure. started off, <laughs> you know, we started off trying to figure out how to mimic birds and fly. Baby steps. And so the first agency was really focused on everything flight. So NASA's bread and butter was aeronautics. We didn't add astronautical stuff until later. The facilities that bared the, Na the NACA crest were Langley and NASA Ames. Going up to my building door every single day and looking at something that is historic and putting the context to that, that I, as a young African-American woman, could have even gone to school at the University of Michigan, a place where I may not have been able to attend 50 or 60 years before. And I can also gain an opportunity to work at NASA who's judging me not off the color of my skin or anything other than my academic qualifications and can contribute to a technology that betters an aspect of the national airspace system or of the space system as a whole is just staggering to me mm -hmm. to think about that and the legacy of the women who did that, because there were just a few. I would love it if I went to work every day and I walked into like a room full of women engineers. Like that would be awesome. <laughs> but we hopefully we, that day is coming soon. I hope so. I need some friends. Like, I don't want to be alone <laughs> at work. You know, I want to walk into this room of like these just really lovely, pretty women engineers. So we don't have to talk about those things like gender inequality, et cetera. We can just talk about the work. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there aren't many females in your position in your field, let alone black females. Uh, what is that experience like? It's exciting. I mean, do you feel like a pioneer or? I, I don't until people ask me that question. <laughs> and then I'm like, I guess so. I mean, I yeah, sure. But I look around at the leadership. I mean, there's a woman in this area, Dr. April Erickson. She's an aerospace engineer. She's phenomenal, right? And I look at the shoulders of the giants on whom I stand and the idea that we're even visible, that I'm sitting in front of a microphone and talking to you about my story is, it's an incredible thought because when I started out six years ago, there wasn't a platform. I don't feel as though the nation had necessarily the focus on women, science, and technology. And it is magnified over the last few years to the point now where I'll wake up and I'll just get on Instagram. And I'm like, oh, there's another one. And there's another one. And I follow all these amazing women that I've never even met. But they are aerospace engineers, they're women of color, and they're doing incredible things. And they're not just in the US, they're globally. And that to me is, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's a really great time to be a woman in science and technology 
And it's really fulfilling to be able to share that, to share all of the things that didn't go right. Because there's this idea that, okay, well, you must have been a baby genius and your path must have been a linear one into NASA and then beyond. And it's like, well, no. If you would have told me 10 years ago that I was going to work at NASA and start a company, I would have thought that you were crazy. If you would have told me 20, like, told me 20 years ago that I was going to graduate from the University of Michigan, I wouldn't have believed you. And so to get into the nooks and crannies of not just my story, but like our story as something that can be used to inspire the next generation, that's the best. Absolutely. We'll be right back in 20 seconds. We hope you liked the episode so far. Please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts or send us feedback by email at engineeringpod at umich.edu. That's engineeringpod at umich.edu. So uh, you were at NASA for six years, and we just talked about how that was your dream job. What prompts you to leave that? I think that they created a monster. (laughs) I would go back to NASA in a heartbeat. I just, it's such a lovely place. And if anyone is living within close proximity to a NASA center, I implore you, go out, see what they do. You will be shocked at how relevant many of the projects are to your day-to-day life. While I was in uh, the Bay Area, I actually had some interactions with local groups um, that were focused on minorities and engineering. And in particular, they were looking at how do we increase representation in higher education? And one day I decided that we should have a field trip. And I would work with my colleagues at the center to make a tour happen so that these organizations could come in and see what we do. Because I realized that when I would tell kids that I was an aerospace engineer, they would look at me like I had 10 heads. What, you? No, like, you're not, that's not, you, no. You are not what we think of when we think of an engineer. And I would ask them what they thought engineers were like, and they would, like, say, well, well, you don't have, like, a pocket protector or, like, a lab coat. And I realized, <laughs> I realized that most students don't have a clear understanding of what engineering is, nor what we do. And I wanted to challenge that because we've got all types at NASA. I promise you. So when we started the, the tour groups, I thought it was going to be one day, and we were done. And it turned into a day that became a life-changing experience for the students. And they kept in touch, and some of them came back and interned. If they didn't intern, they looked into the field of engineering, and it didn't just have to be aerospace engineering. They became excited about what they saw and in many ways they started to understand why the math that they were being taught was so important because they could see the application and a couple years passed and kids are applying to Berkeley for engineering Cal Poly San Luis Obispo aerospace engineering and I'm starting to see that this trip which started off as a hey come in and hang out for us like with us for a day turned into an experience that was powerful enough for students to think differently about their futures. And the more that I was in contact with that, the more that I wanted to understand how could I have that experience and also feed my curiosity for technology. And what I realized was, well, I kind of just made this up. I mean, I'm sitting in this office at NASA. I had a window, and there were hummingbirds that lived in my tree outside my window, and they were beautiful. (laughs) I mean, look, it's like the small things when you're at work, right? Yeah, setting the scene. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to solve problems that are really hard, sometimes having a pair of hummingbirds that are outside your window is like the best possible distraction. I was looking at the birds one day, and I said to myself, you know what? Maybe what you should do is explore the idea of founding a company. Now, people in the Bay know that you could like throw a rock and hit a founder. They're everywhere. 
And what's funny is when you start going to these founder events, you realize that they really think that they can do this stuff. Like they're, they are certain that the next Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg is them and that they're going to be a billion dollar, that like they're going to be a billion dollar business. And once again, I had flashbacks to the feelings that I had in my youth where I didn't really feel like I measured up. Although in many cases, I was one of a few people that had like legit tech cred. Like I had a real job and I worked on real projects, but I didn't think that I could do it. And I ended up running into a colleague who at 25 had founded a engineering firm and was doing exactly what I aspired to do. And he encouraged me to once again think differently about myself and said, well, the only reason why you don't have it is because you don't think you can do it. And the moment that you change that, things are going to shift for you. Once again, success in small wins. It's not, you know, a, a giant downpour. It's like a steady drip. But if you work at it continuously, the universe will organize itself to give you the things that you need. And so six-ish years ago, I started the thought process of, okay, if I was going to find or make a job, what would that look like? Both. Like, if I was going to find a job, what would that look like? And if I was going to make a job, what would that look like? And what I realized was it was a golden window for me to start to build a parachute. I want to be technical. I want to give back. And so we founded Stemboard to do that. And the mission is to develop technologies that advance our nation and our citizens, but we do it for social benefit. And so we founded our tech camps five years ago, and we go out and we teach high school students how to be entrepreneurs. And not just, you know, I've got a dollar and a dream type of entrepreneurs, but to be technically proficient and business savvy by solving a problem that has relevance to their day to day life, right? And so people go, okay, well, what does that mean, right? What is it, what, what, what is involved in these types of activities? And I'll give you a great example. So we had a student group and we brought in some basic electronics and we taught them microcontrollers, uh, sensors that had uh, heat detection and we asked them well what would you what would you do with this and one of the students had a little brother that was always burning himself in the bathtub mm. and they were like why like what is going on there and what they said was he would turn on the water but he never checked the temperature and he mm. would hop in and it was always too hot yeah and I'm like where's parental supervision but i guess that's the second question like <laughs> that's another question we're not going to get into that let's, right. let's let's roll with that so that's what you're thinking about like you're thinking about someone in your family not being burned in the bathtub go what you're going to do about it and what they decided to do blew my mind they built a prototype and they said look we're going to have a sensor that goes in your shower head and when the water turns on It'll have a memory setting for the temperature range that you prefer. And if it's in that range, it's going to have an LED that will illuminate, that will show you visibly that the water is green, good to go, blue for too cold, and red for too hot. Nice. And it will cost, you know, XYZ dollars, which is like really inefficient, and it would fit on, you know, virtually every single shower head in America. I'm like, well, I don't know about shower heads. To- like say right. that, yeah, <laughs> that's not really something that I have a lot of knowledge about. Yeah. But I love that they did two things. They applied a engineering fix to a modern day problem and they built a business revenue model around it. So even if they don't turn that into a business, they've exercised that muscle of intersecting technology and entrepreneurship. And they built the confidence that comes with, hey, I can actually build something and solve this problem. And that, to me, is a lifelong skill. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it is that led me to start this company. Okay. And that's a great outreach program. Is there a technical uh, aspect to it as well? Like, do you guys, like, create technology or is... 
primarily yeah yeah so that's really what the core of it is yeah we give them so depending on the duration of the camp so our flagship is in the caribbean as i mentioned earlier my father's from the bahamas and so we started our first program in the bahamas and it's between five and six days depending on the year and every single day the students day is split predominantly with engineering and they're given hardware They've got software, they've got to code things, they've got to connect things. I buy them drones and sensors, and it's fun. It's like Santa in July, and we have the best time just breaking stuff. Because you got to break it to make it. It works. <laughs> and then, in the afternoon, we sit them down, and they have to build a business around the tech idea that they're developing. And then they have to create a pitch, and then they compete their pitches at the end of the camp. So that's what happens with the multi-day programs. We do, some, we do something similar with the shorter workshops. It's just an abbreviated timeline, but everybody builds something, and then they've got to build it to solve a problem that is relevant to them and present a business case as to why that thing can be profitable. Okay, and how big is STEM board? We are 26 people. 26 people. And growing yeah. fast. Yeah. 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 I was going to say, like, this is, uh, you know, it's a great concept and uh, sounds like a great project. And so, I mean, with the growing revenue, I'm sure there's like more spots available as yeah. well. Yeah. So what's really interesting is our nonprofit partners are an incredible force multiplier. We are the STEM content provider for a national nonprofit called Inroads. Mm-hmm. Inroads has been around for several decades, and they have a large footprint throughout the country. So, if you are interacting with an Inroads program, chances are that our STEM content is um, foundational to that. We also work with governmental agencies. We work with school districts. So that's really how we get the message out. And we have a lot of individuals who work with us, who who are in the academic field that assist as well. When I say STEM board is twenty six people, that's full time people. Okay. Those are not um, individuals that are like Mm part-time because the core of what we do is engineering consulting. So the majority of our staff are engineers. So like my director of education for STEM board has a PhD in nuclear engineering. My curriculum specialist is PhD in instructional design. We're 100% a engineering company with an altruistic program. Okay. Now, your story and your business, inspiring for all people, really. But how would you say it specifically reaches the black community? We are focused on elevating the prospects for the historically underrepresented. And so all of our programming is focused on organizations who have that as part of their mission, as well as communities that have traditionally been underserved. Where the community element comes in is we're not just here for the short term. As I mentioned, we've been operating in these activities for five years. We are looking to build capability not only in in school districts, but also support students that are transitioning into college and into their careers. And what ends up happening is our students come and they give back and they help us do more community engagement, more outreach, more content, and it's been something that started out as a passion project and is just growing rapidly. In addition to making Black History yourself, I guess I'm not the only one who's interested (laughs) in talking to you for Black History Month. It was the honor of my life. I received an email, and it was from a student named Avery. She's in middle school in Georgia, and it was straightened to the point. I guess in middle school, you don't have much time for a pleasantry. <laughs> and she said, my name is Avery, and I am doing a Black History Month project, and I chose you. Can we talk? And I said, well, where's your mom? <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait a second. This is an email. I just need to know, does your mom know that, you, that you've emailed me? And she was like, yes. We can have a conference call with my mom. That sounds great. And we got on the phone, and... I wanted to understand why did Avery choose me? There's a huge number of individuals that she could have selected 
who are very well known and who are very well accepted as Black History Month projects. And Avery said, well, Black history is living history. And the individuals that were commonly selected by my classmates were people that have long gone and they've been done before. And I also wanted to have someone that was relatable and that I felt demonstrated what African-American women were achieving in society today. And when I read about you, what was interesting to me, and I mean, I was trying to keep it together on the other end of the phone because I, I was like a bucket of tears. I mean, Avery is so clearly articulating to me why she wanted to pick someone who was living history and how she was connecting with who she felt was part of black history. And that, that feeling, that feeling that all of the things that I went through in life that I thought were just horrible experiences somehow are being used as inspiration. I, I was without words, and I was happy that Avery had a lot because I was like <laughs> intermittent mute, mute, trying not to cry. Okay, give it to me, Avery. What do you got? What do you need? What do you need to know? And she ended with feeling that it was important that Black women had role models that were accessible, and that demonstrated that you could be more than just one thing. You don't have to just be smart. You can be smart and adventurous. I think that Avery enjoyed the fact that I like to climb mountains in my free time, which I was like, yes, okay. <laughs> uh, at least hiking Kilimanjaro and doing all those things and being freezing cold pays off in the eyes of like a middle school student. Like you actually get some street cred. <laughs> so that's wonderful. And I am, I'm, I'm beyond, like I'm beyond honored to think that I could even be part of that historical lineup. And I'm, I'm so excited for what she has in store for her as black women and women of color become all the more visible in society's landscape with hidden figures and with the focus on achievement in science and technology. Any uh, words of advice to those who are listening? Like, how do you get to where you are or perhaps pursue, a, you know, your dreams in a different uh, line of work or avenue? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I laugh only because when I decided that I was going to start this business. My mom was not a fan. And she will tell you to this day, I thought you were crazy. I didn't think you could do it. And what's funny about that is oftentimes when you are looking to start something new, you'll share your dream with someone else that's close to you. And if they tell you something that is not in line, with what you want to hear, you'll be discouraged by it. And I remember hearing my mom say that. And instead of being discouraged, I felt this burning sensation inside. And I was like, you one day are going to recognize that I'm bigger than the job that I have, that there's more to me than you see. And I'm determined not to prove it to you, but to prove it to myself. And so for those out there who are looking to achieve things, I want people to understand that oftentimes people can't see what's inside of you until you show it. But don't be discouraged by that. Stick to your script. Trust your gut. Trust yourself. And it took me almost until this year to really get comfortable in that, right? It's, it's not you wake up one day and you're like, I'm awesome. I trust myself. Everything's a go. No, you're going to have those days when you don't feel confident, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to be successful. Stick with it. Trust your gut, trust your intuition and allow time to bear out your dream. Very good stuff. Saisha Bo from uh, the CEO of STEM board. <laughs> 
Just want to emphasize that. I don't remember if I said it at the beginning or not, but CEO <laughs> of STEM Board. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for listening. And another thank you to Rob Woodfork at WTOP News in Washington, D.C., and Aisha Bo for letting us share this interview. One more thing before you go. Please subscribe to Re-Engineering Radio from the University of Michigan College of Engineering and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next month. Thank <laughs> you.